This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. I have the honor to introduce Dr. Yolanda Moses from UC Riverside, who will offer a brief assessment of the research context for the issues of the double bind for STEM and SBS faculty. Dr. Moses is a part of this project. She serves on our steering committee, and she's also the PI on her own advanced project at Riverside. Dr. Moses. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. I feel like I'm sort of connected at the hip to people here at UC Irvine because I was also a co-PI on the Irvine initiative of several years headed by Herb Kalaki and Doug Haynes with five Southern California UC campuses. And uh, so I, my car actually came on its own here <laughs> this morning. It was so early I, I, I wasn't able to to sort of use my brain to get here. Um, I am, am um, <clears throat> PI on a grant we have at UCR and, and to do two things. One, to look at how to strengthen the numbers and the success of women in STEM at UC Riverside. And secondly, to look at women of color in STEM across the UC as well as in the CSU and other universities in California because the ends are so small that in order to get critical information, I needed to go outside of our system to understand what is going on. So I wanna thank um, Susan and Kevin and Matt and Jennifer for helping me with this presentation, setting the UC context for issues of the double bind. The two key documents that were mentioned, uh, one in 1976 and one in 2011, looked at double bind literature and came up with recommendations. The first one, 1976, Shirley Malcolm led that. Uh, the one in 2011, uh, Ong Wright, Espinosa, and Orfield. Uh, the double bind, both of them looked at the materials. So what happened? In 1976, there was little or no information, data, on the status of women of color in the sciences. Women of color in the sciences were excluded, they found, from programs for, uh, for underrepresented populations or programs for women because of biases related to race gender, the intersection of the two. And it's this intersectionality that we, will, we hopefully will be uh, delving into today. What does that mean today ver versus what it meant in 1976? Um, so in 1976, it meant that white male scientists or majority women dominated the sciences, and the double bind meant that advances uh, for minorities and efforts to advance women really were focused on white women. They did have recommendations, and you can see those. G, flexible work schedules, financial and policy support for childcare, grant writing education, career workshops, communication workshops, mentoring. But were they implemented? One of the most important things I think came out of this was the fact that they recommended that data finally be collected in this case, by both race and gender. So, 35 years later, what have we done? Inside the Double Bind 2011 continues that, quote, underrepresented women, minority women, remain proportionally underrepresented. Still, inadequacy of programs. 
And <clears throat> the history has shown still that women in, that programs intended to serve women disproportionately benefit white women 35 years later and minority males 35 years later. So from a social science perspective, anthropology, anthropological perspective, there's a culture that needs to be blown up. And, and often this category goes unmarked or it's invisible. And so part of getting at this is how do we get at those unique experiences that continue to exclude uh, women of color? So the pernicious myth that women of color are underrepresented in STEM fields because they are simply not interested does not really hold up. But what are the implications of this for the work that we do or the assumptions that we hold? The author's review of this research literature on undergraduate and graduate students showed that there's still very little, if no, research on women of color faculty in STEM fields. So support from peers and faculty continue to be inadequate. There is a lot put on women of color in terms of extra everything extra of everything, and there's a lot of invisible work that they do that again goes unmarked, unrecognized, and there's a lot of tension and stress that is many times internalized in this process that help contribute to whether or not they're successful. But there are some common characteristics across undergraduate, graduate, and faculty experiences of women of color. There are difficulties of transition and points of loss between the academic stages. And in a slide, I'll show you this discrepancy as they move through the system from high school to undergraduate to graduate to the professoriate. There's a crucial role that climate plays, and we're just starting to interrogate this issue of climate here in the UC. And hopefully, it will give us additional information that we need to understand issues of retention, including isolation, identity, invisibility, negotiation, and of course the research on microaggressions, which we have heard about in, in many of our settings. Does a person belong? Does a person feel like a token? And what is the leadership responsibility for recognizing this and doing something about it, not just about the individual, but about the institution or about the policies and the practice? They also suggest that by creating more women of color STEM PhDs and getting them into faculty positions is also something that Dr. Katehi talked about in our steering committee this morning there's the issue of role models, not just for other minority students or other uh, women minority students, but for white students as well. Having that role model there is also very important. So what does this national transfer to the UC? What do we know about the UC? Well, we know we've come a long way, as Susan has said, but we still have much, much more to do at the undergraduate grad uh, level. Clearly, our president's postdoc program is something unique nationally for us to look at. We've done uh, a very good job in uh, addressing some of the financial aid information, helping students get into grad uh, school, and helping with their career counseling. We put in place family-friendly policies that on some campuses, including my own, some people are still reluctant to use, and we need to understand that. And we've also said that each campus should have in place a diversity equity structure to support women of color. The question is, do we? And if we do, how effective is it? So there is data underway to help us define successes, challenges, and our next steps. Clearly, the six uh, NSF paid grants within the UC will go a long way in doing that. We have a wonderful group of chief diversity officers and uh, there's a, a grad uh, council group that, according to Marianne Mason, is just the best. 
in terms of their work that they do together. Uh, we also have an unprecedented opportunity to collect data through the president's uh, climate survey that, that is coming up this fall for all of our faculty, staff, and students. And then we have our partnerships with the UC Academic Senate, the various committees that are interested in this work. Next slide. This is a slide that looks at um, two, at least two different uh, things. The first column is California high school graduates. Who graduates from California high schools and in what numbers? And as you could see, for white women, as we go across from California graduates to UC enrollees to bachelor's conferred to UC doctorates conferred, that the, those numbers, while they start small and the population get larger as we get to the other side. If we look at Asians, women, we can see that that number gets small. If we look at uh, Hispanic women, it, it's even smaller. And Native Americans stay consistently small at 1%, and African Americans, as you see, go down to 3% in this slide. So this next slide looks at female headcount by ethnicity in the UC, in the tenure track and equivalent faculty. Um, and it's divided by UC faculty overall, UC SBS faculty, and UC STEM faculty. And you see what I mean about the single digits. As we move from, in, if in, the, in the system, we have the numbers for UC faculty uh, overall, and then if we look at SBS faculty, and then if we get over and look at STEM faculty, we see that for Native American women and for African American women, for Hispanic women, those numbers are really small. So this one looks at both male and female hires, all faculty across the UC, all disciplines, and then STEM disciplines only. And again, you see the consistency of, of white males and females, Hispanic males and females, African American males and females, American Indian males and females. And if we look at, uh, if we look at the numbers, if the faculty get into the pools, uh, they are likely to be looked at and, if, and some of them are likely to be hired except for the Asian um, population. So that's something else that, that we should look at. In terms of STEM disciplines only, you see the numbers again going down, down, down. And for American Indians, they get, there's this interviewee and then hires zero percent. So the, not, the ends are small to begin with, but the, and the question is twofold, how to increase those ends, but also what does this mean? What happens in the interview process? And those are the kinds of things that hopefully we will be looking at. We'd like to compare ourselves, obviously, to our peers. And as you can see, the University of California, with the largest system by far in terms of our numbers, uh, these are our quote unquote peer institutions that we use to compare ourselves to quite a bit. We could spend a, quite a bit of time just looking at this slide. But the idea here is to look at how do we stack up in terms of total number of women across these systems, percentage-wide, that gives you a sense. And um, SUNY Buffalo obviously has a larger percentage of women than we do. Um, uh, Yale uh, does, but their numbers, again, as I say, are small. Uh, if we look at underrepresented minorities in terms of um, the numbers, they, uh, we have 8.4% total, but we only have 3.2% uh, women, underrepresented minority women in our system. And it should give us some pause for thinking about just not doing what we do more of it, but doing what we do differently and more effectively. How do we do that? It seems to me that is our charge here today. And to think about the role of leadership and to think about the role of data and drilling down to find out 
what those obstacles are, at least on our own, on our own campuses. So while we're comparing ourselves uh, to other institutions, we need to look at our own internal practices, uh, the, the way internally we focus on uh, change, and to look at the best practices that are already out there. We are including a, a broad definition of, of STEM, which means we can call on our social sciences to work with us in the, in, in the other STEM fields to come up with not just data, but information about how to shift, how to change, how to create transformation in the work that we do. Because 35 years later, being almost at the same place in terms of how we see what we do, or the results of what we do, should give us all pause. And so that's the introduction to the day. It's the context that sets the stage. Rather than women and minorities being the empty cell, which it has been for 35 years, we're saying put this on the table. It's the center of what we need to be talking about today. So that's my formal presentation, and I have time for questions and comments. Thank you. In that slide, you compare the University of California, I presume all of us, with specific campuses of other institutions. If you were to break UC out into different campuses, would it make any difference? And you show that we're not doing too badly in the general comparison. Um, and then on the right-hand side, where you get to the percentages of URM and URM women, uh, there's only two places that are ahead of us, both of which are uh, campuses of large uh, state institutions. Uh, do some of the campuses of the University of California do better than we do on average, or is it all pretty much the same? Um, I will let maybe Matt say something about that. Uh, I think in the aggregate, well, I think there are some campuses that do a little bit better, but I don't think there is any one campus that is, is um, a standard deviation or anything from what we've come up with, yes. Sally Marshall, UCSF, we have 44% women. I know that that's not counting just the series that you ca you're counting in this, this table, but right. overall we have 44% women. Okay. Doug Haynes, UCI. It, it, uh, just to follow up on Harry's question, it, it's interesting that this is the aggregate of all disciplines. Right. right? It includes non-STEM as well, and I think historically and in practice at all of our campuses, the vast majority of our racial and ethnic diversity is situated in arts, uh, humanities, and social sciences for the most part. And so in some sense, you know, you have to mine down into the data in order to draw, I think, better conclusions about what this data means in relationship to faculty diversity. Oscar Debon, uh, UC Berkeley. Oh, hi. Uh, hi. Uh, I have a question about uh, when I see the share just within uh, UC, uh, when I compare the share of women to the total, 29% or, or close to 30%, and then I, if I were to compare the share of uh, underrepresented women to the total underrepresented minorities, it looks like uh, those, sh it's, for the most part, they're similar. Um, in fact, the share of women amongst the underrepresented minorities is uh, a little bit higher than that overall. Uh, does that say, imply that uh, the gender issue is perhaps a greater uh, bind than the underrepresented uh, issue? Uh, that's a very good question. What the research shows is that the intersection of those two things present a unique kind of experience that is slightly different from underrepresented males and from white males. And so that's what we need to be interrogating. What 
are those experiences and who can best tell us that on the ground or through in this pipeline, whether we're talking about undergrad students to grad students, grad students to uh, applying for faculty positions, what happens in that process. All of these things have to be looked at uniquely through that, through that lens to really get to answering your question. And that's what we hope to do. So thank you for the question. Hi. Yes, hi. And I've read UC Santa Barbara. Uh, I was uh, thinking about your comment that 35 years later uh, and that we have made very little progress in terms of ERMS and women in STEM and that that should give us pause. I was thinking about the additional complication that we are confronting depending on the outcome of Fisher v. Texas and whether or not we should be thinking about a contingency plan should the Supreme Court decide that affirmative action is in fact somehow unconstitutional. <laughs> I, will, I will start off and then hopefully other people will say what they want to say before I say something I perhaps shouldn't say. <laughs> but uh, actually, Prop 209 took that away from us a while ago. So we have had, in my opinion, a contingency plan in place for the past 10 years. And the question is, how are we doing? with that contingency plan. And what I mean by that is if you look at, those of you who work with faculty committees on the campuses, you know that one of the first things that comes up in committees is that, well, we can't do this because of Prop 209. Well, of course, that's not the case. But it's where we start. We have to start educating our committees about what it means not to hire someone on the basis of race and gender. So in my opinion, regardless of what happens with Fisher, we're going to have to continue to be vigilant about what it is we value and what it is we want to see and how do we use our bully pulpit as faculty, I have on my faculty hat, to say this is an educational excellence issue, this is how we define it, and this is how we're going to do it. And to use diversity as a criteria is something that the UC has done, at least in terms of our documents. But if you drill down further, there is still this miseducation about what you can and can't do around that, around that issue. So it's a very good question, but this begs that question. What I'm talking about here begs that question. It has to do with what kind of universities do we want to be, and how do we go about mirroring that in the way we recruit, hire, and make successful our faculty. Well, that doesn't mean just standing still and treading water. It means that we have to be proactive in a lot of ways that other institutions may or may not have to do. Yes. Um, Last Chris, question. Okay. I, there, I have a I statement guess. and a question. Okay, I mean, Chris. You invited us to, uh, to speak further to the 209 issue. Yes. Um, 209 says no preference. It does not say no action. Um, Nancy Hopkins had a lovely little posting saying, maybe we should call it affirmative effort rather than affirmative action so people wouldn't be confused. All that is prohibited by 209 is preference. That's right. It does not prohibit outreach. It does not prohibit efforts to find and get into the pool an adequate number of people of different kinds. I mean, after all, no one person is diverse. The applicant pool can be diverse. The faculty can be diverse. But there is no such thing as a diverse person. Right? <laughs> So this applies to all of our efforts to recruit that we, should, that we need to use best efforts. And in fact, as a federal contractor, we are required by the Office of Federal Contract Compliance to use best efforts to attract and recruit a diverse workforce. And so that's our, you know, the first thing we want to do is to keep those government contracts coming. And faculty will respond to that, right? The, um, the question I had, actually, 
was about a refinement of the data. I, we hire a great number of people who's, who come from uh, different parts of Asia. And, and they are usually counted with those people who are Asian American in, uh, in their family and in their, uh, in their culture, but have been America, U.S. citizens for all of their lives. It, it is a distinctly different group right. and may require some different ways of, of, of integrating into uh, the U.S., but we don't break it out. Do you have any sense of how we can effectively work with Asian American women um, in two different ways, right? Mm -hmm. Asian American women who have been in the U.S. for all their lives and Asian American women who arrived in the U.S. last year. Um, and I've, I've seen different needs among those two groups, but we don't have a way of pulling it out. Thanks. That's a very good que question, Chris, and it's one that our data group has been wrestling with, but it's also true of Hispanic women. It's also true of black women, because we say African-American, but we also have women who come from other uh, African diaspora countries as well, who identify as black. And we, we have big buckets and we lump people together. So part of this exercise is about disaggregation and finding out what's happening to individual groups on the ground, their experiences, that, and that will help us. And I'm out of time, so thank you all. And hopefully these conversations will continue and we can hear at the end what we should do. Thank you very much, Yolanda. To, to me, the encouraging number up here, or the useful and maybe encouraging number up here is the 293 female URM faculty that we have at UC. I mean, it, practically as many as everybody else put together. Now that's all disciplines, but there are, are communities we can build on, and I think that will be part of our conversation today. It's the power of you know, having 10 campuses we can work with. 